Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Karen Beckman, and I'm the interim director of the Penn Humanities Forum this year. First, I want to welcome you to tonight's forum event. A special welcome to the New Media Technology Charter School over there. It's always great to see school group, and I hope you come back for our other events. Thanks for coming, and thanks to your teachers for bringing you. Um, we have a number of events coming up that have been rotating on the screen. Um, I'll just flag an upcoming performance by the Daedalus Quartet, um, which features music by composers in exile. And um, that's coming up soon, so details of that are on our website. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to make a few announcements. Um, first, I'd like to ask you to turn off all your cell phones and also camera flashes, please. Um, we'll pause momentarily after the lecture because there's usually people who have to leave right away before the Q&A, but then we'll have a Q&A and I'd ask you to wait for the microphone um, so that we can um, all hear your questions. I also want to thank my uh, colleagues in the Penn Humanities Forum, Jim English, Jennifer Conway, Sarah Varney, and Kate Aid, for their help and energy in putting together tonight's program and all the other programs we do. And I want to give a special thanks to uh, Penn Professor Brendan O'Leary, who's sitting down at the front, um, who is um, an extremely accomplished scholar in his own right on uh, questions of violence and conflict resolution, and has been um, extremely helpful, especially in the early stages of our putting together the program for the year, and in helping us think about who would be interesting and important speakers. And it's through him that we learned of Christian Davenport's work. So thank you very much for your help. It's a pleasure and an honor to welcome tonight's speaker, Christian Davenport, to the forum and to introduce him to you. Christian is a professor of political science at the University of Michigan, where he is a faculty associate of the Center for Political Studies and of the Institute for Social Research, both impressive and vibrant research institutes. And one of the things I've noticed about all our speakers this year is how actively they are involved they are in various research and non-research communities. And it strikes me that uh, people who work on violence day in and day out really uh, seek out community as one way to sustain themselves as they think about these difficult questions. He describes himself on his website as being, and I'm quoting, interested in political conflict and violence, particularly that involving governments and those affiliated with them, with his work focusing on issues such as genocide and politicide, mass killing, torture, bans, curfews, beatings, arrests for political purposes, and domestic spying. As a scholar, he is a model of someone capable of looking at both global patterns and individual case studies, and he moves easily between the big picture and small local pictures, and this ability has moved his attention around the United States, Rwanda, India, Northern Ireland, as well as more recently Darfur, Sudan, and Mexico. His work demonstrates a rare methodological flexibility, and over the course of his career so far, he has employed a diverse range of approaches, including statistical research, ethnography, film, and gaming. This attention in his own work to the way to the tools we use impact how and what we are able to think about is also the subject of some of his books in some ways, as in Media Bias, Perspective and State Repression, The Black Panther Party from 2010. Here, as in other publications, such as State Repression and the Domestic Democratic Peace and the edited volume Repression and Mobilization, he is interested in, in exploring how physical and structural violence interact with state and local political structures and the basic human desire for political expression. His work highlights what, some, what we uh, know something about, such as how violent and nonviolent tactics are likely to be used by authorities and protesters, and what after effects are likely in such situations. But his work also goes in search of what we don't really understand and find more difficult to think about, certain types of behavior, the temporal complexity and multidimensionality of contempt contentious political situations across time and space, and how to deal with those biases inherent in existing research resources. I personally have never encountered a scholar who is more creative in seeking out innovative tools with which to explore these harder to access issues. A brief glance at his wonderful website reveals novels, videos, scholarly articles and books, reports, newspaper articles, and a whole gamut of individual human engagement. 
He has been a director of no fewer than eight major initiatives and centers, including the Radical Information Project, the Minorities at Risk Project, and the Center of International Development and Conflict Management. He's also the recipient of six major fellowships, the associate editor of the Journal of Conflict Resolution, one of the highest ranked journals in the fields of political science and international relations, and he is a prolific author. And I don't use this word lightly. I cannot overemphasize how impressive the scholarly production of this single man is. Indeed, as I've been reading his work over the last few weeks, I did start to wonder whether, in fact, there may not just be one Christian Davenport and whether it actually checked out books by multiple different authors. Because of this, I'm not going to even attempt to list uh, his entire body of work, so just know that as I describe our speaker, you're missing a whole lot, and you have a whole lot of reading ahead of you. So, and you know a whole different you know many multiple kind of aspects of this uh, intellectual figure, such as Christian Davenport, the Archer, about whom I know nothing. Um, but in addition to the scores of articles, he is the author of *To Kill a Movement: Mobilization, Repression, and Demobilization of the Republic of New Africa*, which is forthcoming from Cambridge University Press. He's also written not one but two novels, um, and has three co-authored projects underway. Toward Never Again, How Can We End Ongoing Mass Killing, In Search of a Number, Rethinking Rwanda, and Understanding Untouchability. And it is the last of these titles that reflects his topic for this evening's talk. Our last public lecture by Professor, uh, Penn Professor Anya Lumba addressed the topic, The Violence of Gandhi's Nonviolence, and I'm glad that we have the opportunity to deepen our conversation about India tonight and perhaps to carry on some of the questions with which her talk last week ended. Christian's way of living puts to bed the rumor that if only you don't get too involved, you'll get more done. I want to thank him and express my great admiration for his ongoing work and engagement to bring about the greater freedom of expression and the resolution of complex and long-standing conflicts and to help us better to understand how both violence and peace come about. Please join me in welcoming him. introductory part is always strange for me because you don't really think about what you're doing. As you do it, you're just kind of engaged, right? So um, what becomes somewhat fascinating and puzzling sometimes is when you're actually confronted with your, your different selves. So I, I myself wonder how many of me there are, or, or, or how, many the, how many are left because the others are getting used up, and effectively, we need some help. So I think this is why I teach. It's also the reason um, I think recently I've just become aware of the fact that, in large part, we are, as instructors, we are allowed to recruit individuals into different vocations, and social justice is the one that I kind of push my students towards and acknowledge that it is a calling. Some are going to do it, some are not going to do it, but having access to the youth, I think it's useful to push in this direction. So. Today I'm going to talk about this Untouchability project that I've uh, been conducting and been engaged with for 2004, 2003. I'm, they, not that they all blend together, but it's not quite clear exactly where, where you stop them. The, and up until this talk, I hadn't had an opportunity to kind of reflect on all of the different uh, elements of the project, and thus when I was approached by by the forum, I was, uh, I was more than excited to kind of to step forward and, and think about exactly how um, I've addressed a topic of violence and how um, I've drawn upon or been pulled into or utilized to maintain sanity um, parts of the social sciences and the humanities to kind of discuss and engage with and think about this particular topic. Um, typically, a talk in political science or sociology um, which I used to identify as home now. It's like uh, I spent some time around um, some interdisciplinary group, and, and now, like, while I'm based in one, I've, I kind of reject them all simultaneously. And, and so part of that is uh, a rejection of the standard talk. So normally I'd come and give you my particular puzzle, 
and I give you some theory, um, not always the most comprehensive one, but the one that I studied, and I present it to you as if that was all of it. And then I derive some hypotheses that logically followed from that. I tell you about my evidence, and I do the rest of the stuff that's on the slide. But um, you're not here to get that today. Um, today, we're going to basically talk about the study of the study of untouchability. Um, and I, I want to do it by, by first kind of laying out exactly what it is that the problem involves, and then how I moved to take the particular approach that I did, um, along with the scholars that are involved in it. This is um, clearly a, a collaborative effort, um, largely dominated by uh, myself and uh, uh, Martin Makwan, who um, is an activist from Ahmedabad, India, working with a group called Navsarjan Trust, which means trust new creation. Um, principally, it's um, the two of us that are doing the different um, aspects of the project, and then others are coming in and out. Um, so what's integral got to do with it? Um, there's some interesting kind of work that comes out in um, discussions of the, eco of the uh, ecology and the environment and so forth. And, and part of what I think has become clear to me as a, as a scholar of political conflict and violence and peace, actually, I'll, I'll add that in. I, I, I was outed, or I outed myself when I was at Notre Dame, that I am, I am a peace scholar. I study conflict and violence to end it. I have no problem saying that now. Um, I think when you become full, also, you, ch you change your willingness to speak about some topics. But I think I've come to realize that political scientists, not strangely, offer political science explanations for things. Sociologists, accordingly. Psychologists, accordingly. But actually, I think in order to understand the topic, you need, you need all of them. They're all related to one another, and thus the key is to try to figure out exactly how they are fitting together. But then pushing past that, um, if anyone interacts with me for too long, the, the one here that I'm from New York, the two here that my mother was a dancer, um, she was the eighth member of Alvin Ailey, and then proceeded to do a bunch of other interesting and occasionally foolish things, but all within the arts, um, and now she's a painter. Um, and that experience that upbringing influenced me dramatically. One, it influenced me because I did not want to become an artist. I became a social scientist, in, in part because I wanted a job consistently. <laughs> um, and second, um, it was uh, useful to kind of uh, get some general sense of kind of what else was out there apart from the community that I've been a part with. So um, my discussion today will almost seamlessly make it seem as if I draw upon a bunch of different influences simultaneously. Um, but I don't know that I've necessarily been as conscious of that as I would like to be. Um, so all this begins with um, a friend of mine um, who was at the Robert F. Kennedy Center for Human Rights, um, uh, Todd Howland. And Todd was just like, you know, Chris, come over for a minute. And so I stupidly thought it was like I was going to get a T-shirt. I was going to get to meet one of the Kennedys. I thought I'd get some, I'd have a beverage. We'd go out to eat afterwards. But no, this is, um, Todd kind of rolls like this. So I come in the office and there's somebody from India. And at the time I was like, cool, nice to meet you. Um, so it turns out that they had a, um, a human rights concern. They were curious, as, as many activists are, they were curious about um, what they were doing and whether or not it worked. And so kind of very simple impact assessment kind of evaluation, right? So you're just trying to figure out among the activities that they're engaging in, which one is improving the condition of the thing that they're interested in changing in this context, untouchability. And so we had Martin was the person, Martin Makwan was the individual that we had a conversation with. And then we started talking about kind of what he wanted to do. And so over time, um, different people get involved in the project in accordance to the project's needs. Um, we have some activists. We have some lawyers. We have some advocates. We have some social scientists um, from different disciplines. And we had a, a bunch of students. Um, from a bunch of different institutions from around the globe. So our study takes place in oops, sorry, uh, Gujarat, which is the kind of westernmost point of India. Um, as Ambekdar suggests, uh, India is not a country, it's a continent. The, the, the variation you find within this country is astounding. Um, and Gujarat is, in many respects, kind of a hard case for the thing that we want to talk about, as it's one of the more economically developed states. It's viewed as an economic miracle in many respects. In certain contexts, we would think that if you, if any state should not have any type of discrimination, given theories of economic development and so forth, that, um, 
that Gujarat would probably be uh, the location. So what is untouchability? Um, untouchability is deep breath because it, it's one of the most complex things you could probably think about. It's 3,000 years old. It is principally based upon separation, division of labor, and the hierarchy. This, uh, these three characteristics are extremely important for us because it is through this prism that we come to understand everything that is engaged with the topic. Now, it's persisting for 3,000 years in part because it is infused within the dominant religion of the society. It is an intricate part of um, Hinduism as based on some of the most important um, manuscripts associated with the religion. It is, you're socialized into it. You, you were born into a particular caste. You stay there. That is reinforced through every aspect of your existence, as I will talk about in a minute. Um, and what untouchability should be seen as is not only this um, hierarchy, but it is the means for keeping you in your place. It is a, a series or host of sanctions that are imposed. It's a series of practices that reveal to you who you are and who you will never be. It is all of these things. Now, um, we spent... Um, approximately, well, um, other individuals involved in the ethnography and studying different aspects of untouchability worked out. Um, uh, there's been a series of lists of untouchability that were conducted over time. So we drew upon a lot of this research and we engaged with a lot of these scholars and developed a list of different practices. There are a host of different practices. Um, some concern um, water um, restrictions. So um, do you have access to a village well? Um, sometimes you are able to actually get water yourself. That's, that's one of the nicer villages with regards to untouchability practices. In certain locations, you are not allowed to get the water yourself because you would pollute the water. So someone has to pour the water for you. If that person is not around, then you have to wait. And so literally, you have water issues. You have food and beverage. Will people touch the same plates that you have used? Will they eat in the same locations that you would wish to eat? Um, you have touch. Um, there's this bitty smoke thing. It's kind of like chewing tobacco. Um, well, you basically, you know, you take it out of the can, you put it in the side of your mouth. Some people will not allow you to use the same can. There's a million, or actually, uh, there's a hundred different types of, uh, of these restrictions of space, uh, practice. Um, I'll talk about some of these. But we elaborate exactly what these things are. We all actually bring them all together in one spot. But the list of, the sheer list of different things that you can or cannot do is um, incredible, actually, when you think about it. Um, so I argue this is one of the world's oldest and, and, and slowest crimes against humanity. Uh, if if everyone, anyone ever heard the phrase slow genocide? I mean, it's like most of the genocides, most of the political, I mean, I studied, I studied Rwanda for far too long. Um, but basically, you know, that basically took place in like a month and a half. It's not the three months thing. It was, it was very short. It was very fast. A lot of people, several hundred thousand people were killed and very quickly. Um, the number of people killed because of untouchability, the number of people that were killed overtly from it in a short kind of abuse or atrocity and the people that were kind of structurally killed because they didn't have access to decent water, food, and so forth, it's got to be in the millions, right? We have... We have 3,000 years worth of a practice. We have a population, the, the untouchable, or, or as they prefer, the Dalit, um, those who are oppressed. Uh, you know, think, of the, think of the change in the phrase, right? Um, I no longer say slaves now. I say enslaved because it kind of communicates the point very clearly. These people are not natural. They are constructed. They are pushed in a particular location and are kept there from a series of practices, untouchability. But... But it's not really the most, Rwanda was dramatic, right? The bodies piled up quickly. You, you saw hatchets. You could imagine the pace. This is, this is slow. This is not at all troubling in certain respects because it appears to be normal. One of the things before I went to India, I, I was reading a bunch of people that wrote about it, and they kept talking about how well the society fit together, how, how, how everyone seemed to have their place without acknowledging how you got to your place and, and how you stayed in your place, which is just 
rent with violence. So I'll actually argue that what we standardly consider personal integrity violations, torture, disappearances, um, arrests, beatings, attacks on the physical person, that's clearly there. Civil liberties restrictions, speech, association, assembly. These people are forced to live in a particular part of town around certain things and cannot do certain things. They have to get off roads when other people are coming. There's every type of restriction you can matter there. Soft repression, uh, Myra Marx Faree talks about this as well. Um, rumors, people talking about you, this also serves as a kind of social, political sanction as well. And then, I mean, I'm, an, I'm kind of an old political conflict scholar, so structural violence as well. This thing is structured to kill you. Not, not in mass, right, which differentiates from genocide in many respects, but it's to keep you in a particular spot in life and in that space unfortunately, a lot of you are going to die. So um, the odd part about this, um, the odd part about much of the topic is I think I was built to study untouchability. Being an African American, you're just very familiar with restrictions, right? So this comes from, um, this comes from a study, um, I'm forgetting the author's name, but they're talking about Pauli, Pauli Murray. Um, but um, she's talking about all the different types of restrictions that exist by state, right? So there were segregation laws on separate billiard, billiard, billiard houses and pools, um, circuses. Circuses are segregated. Um, separate washrooms and mines, tu tubercular patients, nursing, railroads, streetcars, the sheer host of things that existed with regards to the discriminatory and segregation policies, it's also um, quite varied. Uh, the, the chart basically identifies by state law exactly what the variation is across states regarding segregation laws. I mean, we're all very much familiar with um, kind of housing covenants. Those familiar with Detroit history know that, that that was a very big aspect of that particular history. And with people being not able to kind of live where they wanted to. And of course, we're also familiar with lynching. Um, there's this, this pyre, the, the burnt, charred body. You see this quite frequently within caste-related violence as people attempt to kind of step out of their place. They are treated in a similar manner. And thus, I did not feel like I, this, this topic was completely alien to me. And thus, um, I felt, unfortunately, that I was um, prepared to kind of talk about it. So I went, as a social scientist in many respects, I went to um, study this particular problem and think about impact assessment. I went to think about what they're doing, what's working, and whether or not um, it's having the effect that they want, acknowledging that I needed to know about untouchability. So, I go to India as an ethnographer, and, and part of my ethnography is, uh, this is Martin, by the way, um, part of my ethnography is to get to know the place, right, to interact with the people. This is Manjula Pradip, who takes over Nafsa John Trust after Martin steps down. Um, and we engage in a series of conversations. This is uh, Professor Al Stam from Michigan. We engage in a series of conversations about what's going on. So part of what is happening is they're teaching us about untouchability and we are teaching them about some of the aspects of social science that we are interested in. This is a, this is a student in the school that they have in North Sajan called um, Dalit, um, those who are oppressed, uh, Shakti Kendra, so Dalit Power School, um, which is just uh, a phenomenal institution. Um, I, I took most of the pictures. Um, but uh, this is um, my, my then graduate student, David Armstrong. What was fascinating was uh, the ghost of Ambektar, uh, one of the more famous leaders of uh, uh, the Dalit and King are everywhere. And uh, there are repeated conversations about this. Um, I ended up writing a story called The King in I, basically about how I was viewed as an African American coming to this particular movement and how that um, made me feel. And this is Martin speaking in front of one of the uh, groups of students, which is just, um, it's an amazing kind of uh, discussion. These kids come from, Dalit youth are coming from all over. Um, Amdabat or Gujarat basically to come to this place to kind of learn uh, a trade, learn some issues um, that would be relevant for their kind of existence in this world and also learn about activism and social justice, which is fascinating when they're learning that they actually are human and they do have human rights. And this is the strangest class to ever listen to, but it is nevertheless um, one that is extremely powerful. So part of my surviving this particular experience, and I say surviving because it's very... Um, it's very jarring, very, very taxing to actually kind of piece it all together. Just when you think you have a handle of what's kind of going on, there's another element that's added. Um, I don't know about you, but part of my processing involves um, writing. Um, these, are, these are among the first 
uh, short stories that I wrote. And I'm kind of a pick a path kind of person, so which one did you want to hear? Brendan, since you got me here, which one would you like to hear? I thought you were going to do that. Um, we traveled far into the deep recesses of Gujarat, far from Ahmedabad, the mega city that it was. Our journey took us to places where blacks, African Americans, had never been, at least not physically. They were represented in some manner through television. Exactly who made it out here, however, was the subject of the next story. Interestingly, my presence resulted in a bizarre chain of events as we evidently had someone running between the villages announcing simply that Mike Tyson was coming. <laughs> in the first village, I was asked if I was Mike Tyson, the boxer known once for knocking everyone out in five seconds, but later known for biting off a piece of Evander Holofield's ear. I said, no, my name is Chris. In the second village, it was assumed that I was Mike Tyson, and I was asked how my fighting career was going. <laughs> I said that I did not fight anymore and repeated my name. They did not buy it. By the sixth village, I gave up on the Chris business and played along and asked, and when asked to do something, I threw a jab and everyone smiled, cheering, Iron Mike, Iron Mike, Iron Mike. <laughs> the crowd was happy. The former world champion had visited their poor village. At the 10th village, someone asked me if I would stop a local bully. It was said that he looked, he looked like me. I was a little scared and even a little tempted, but I did not pursue the matter. Although everyone around me looked to be four foot three, you never know what the Indian Iron Mike would look like, and thus I decided to step off. At the 13th village, it was said that I bit the ears of my opponents when I fought. I denied it and said that when I fight, I fight clean. They, these were just rumors from those that feared me. At the 16th village, it was thought that I just bit off people's ears when I wanted to. In and out of the ring, the children would not greet me in these places, and the older folks kept to themselves. Upon our arrival in the 17th village, we found it completely empty. Having heard that Mike Tyson, the man-eater, was coming, the villagers had vacated, realizing where this was going, and acknowledging that it could get far, far worse we headed back to Ahmedabad. So for me, um, the stories became useful because literally I could not actually piece it together in terms of like what was going on. So I was kind of taking field notes to myself. I had this notebook. And then when I came back and then was interrogated by my mother and my grandmother, um, I ended up writing about this as well because this became a trip as I get chastised for not telling them what I was doing ahead of time and what was going to happen. In many respects, I was like, I, didn't know, I did not know what was going to happen. And thus, we end up in these um, bizarre conversations, but it became useful for me to kind of process them through um, writing. And so um, short stories became something that I engaged in. Um, as we started to delve into the field and think about exactly how we could facilitate conversations, part of what you do when you do kind of like large-scale research is you conduct focus groups. And so we started conducting focus groups to try to figure out what was going on. And many people were kind of like, you were kind of trying to reveal something to them that they were not that familiar with in many respects, at least not in the way we were discussing it. They lived it, but actually discussing it and thinking about what was there, it became useful to kind of, um, um, and a, a largely illiterate population, we had to kind of prompt people to think about exactly what it is we were trying to talk about. So we worked with some artists to get some cards um, made that we could hand out when we were out in the field to kind of prompt individuals or elicit conversations about different topics. And so um, there is a practice for the Dalit, and they are, they are forced to clean feces out of these particular areas with their hands and, and with the broom. And thus, we, we took um, those images. There is discriminatory patterns within school, um, the individuals that are sitting on the ground, it's not normally that they're sitting on the side, they're normally in the back. Um, and um, if you look very closely, they, they have the tattered clothing where it's all patched up, I mean, very, very subtle, but, but, but nevertheless powerful. Um, we were then using these to kind of get conversations started about discrimination and violence and so forth. And, and um, the next one became extremely important. Um, because now we started to kind of prompt individuals to reflect upon the violence that's associated with untouchability. And so not only is there violent activities where people are being beaten and killed and so forth, there's also, you need to conceive it also as 
acknowledging that it was because of untouchability that it existed. And so it was just not the violence, but also the reason for it that um, we were prompting, which also ended up forcing us or compelling us and acknowledging that we needed to have psychologists in, in the group. Napsa John had them as well, but it became, um, this is when my RB, I had a, like a huge problem, right, because I didn't realize that I thought we were talking about civil liberties restrictions and some other stuff. It, the violent part and atrocities did not, did not yet occur to me, which became uh, another, another point. Um, we later moved to, um, this is, I'm, I'm condensing several years, right? I think I, by this time I've been to India back and forth about three times, uh, th about two to three months each trip. Um, and so my second trip back, um, the, the mandatory group photo, right? Notice that the, the Americans are very happy, but uh, se se separate, separate point. Um, we then start to kind of explore the country a little bit more. We, because um, like the first couple of times, it's basically we got the we got the Navsarjan view of um, the topic. We got exposed to certain things on campus. We got exposed to the theorists that they wanted us to read about. We got exposed to the programs of the center. Then we started to go see untouchability. Um, and what was fascinating for me is, in many respects. Um, some stuff's pretty clear, like um, this particular, I take this picture in part because I'm in the back of the room with the, with the Dalit children, and then I actually said something, and evidently no one had spoken from the back of the room. So this is like, you just, Rosa Parks, it's just like, all, you just imagine all these things that are like hitting you simultaneously. So everybody kind of turned around, they were just like, there's people in the back of the room. And so this became intriguing because then you start to reveal that um, many of these things that we were starting to explore were very common. Um, two individuals and we start going into villages and we start talking about um, this is before this is kind of like pre the pilot stage type of thing we start talking about the feasibility of what it is that we're going to try to do and so we start talking to people in villages about what types of problems that they're having and so forth now Napsa John is extremely important in the sense that um, Napsa John by this point is in about like 4,800 villages there's two members from the organization that are in, e in each village they live there, they're from there, they're trained by Napsar John, they are monitoring human rights violations in the place. Um, they are monitoring untouchability practices as these overlap with human rights violations, but they are in all of these villages and thus we're going around randomly to, um, I think initially we did 150 villages to just talk with them about what was going on there and what could be done about it. Um, this is called a, a ramp rampatar, and a rampatar is like, if someone comes to your house, there's, there's tea, uh, you'll, you'll notice, um, there's, there's tea with everything, right? It's like you, you go to any place, it's, like, it's not three cups, right? It's just one, but basically one cup that just keeps coming. And so effectively, you just, um, you just keep experiencing the tea element. And part of the discriminatory pattern with regards to untouchabilities and Dalits in particular, some places don't serve you, they don't serve Dalits tea. Not in a cup, at least. They might serve it in a saucer, or they have a designated place outside of their house with a cup that is placed there for the Dalit to use which then becomes yet another manifestation of it when like someone's offering me tea in a cup, but the people that I'm with, they're offered this, this cup thing that's coming out of a wall, which, um, you know, um, that, that did not go too well. Um, and then we start to kind of explore and converse about a bunch of different things. Um, here we end up um, in this one village, um, and it became useful for me to kind of go to this one place because we were just gonna go, you know, it's India, right? We started to go get some fabric. Um, and then, um, and then we're, we're, we were going to go shopping, but before we went shopping, uh, we were going to stop in this uh, one dollar village that was behind this hotel. Um, amazing five star hotel, uh, really fabulous, and we kind of went behind it. And then it just like became this kind of like series of uh, this labyrinthian kind of thing that led to a riverfront. Um, so al alternatively in this building, um, there's either trash or someone's living there. Um, as these people collected trash from this part of the city, they then kept it in these locations where they could go through it and then see what they wanted to keep. And at this point, there was nothing but children that were around during the day, and thus it became um, kind of interesting that we were there, and there's nothing but youth. So we end up, this is, a, this is Mukesh um, uh, telling me about something. He was another person from Napsa John. And we end up going past this, and then we end up getting to the riverfront, and we could see kind of like the Gandhi ashram across the, what was river. And the river thing is actually quite huge, but the actual amount of water is like this, and it does not look anything like what we call water. And while we're standing there talking, at least 30 people or so had come up, excuse me, but you did come to a violence forum, so I could be as nasty as I want, I suppose. 
Um, so we're just kind of standing there. These people walk up, and they like pull up their stuff, and they're just like looking at you to see what we're doing while they're taking a shit. And I'm just, I just, that just tripped me out because I'm just like, we're just having a conversation. And then I realized where I'm standing, what's going on. I'm like, oh man, missed that one. And then we kind of like walk back, and then we get back to this area. But by this time, there's like 250 kids that are there, and one evidently learned some kind of English phrase and came up and introduced himself. And just instinctively, right, I'm like, uh, hey, what's up, man? And so, like, he shakes my hand. And then, like, uh, by the 40th kid, I kind of realize, I'm like, I, 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 I'm, you know, I, I'll admit it. I was like, I don't have enough hand sanitizer for this. I'm like, this is, this is just going to be bad. And I'm like, and, like, the kids were, at the same time, beautiful and horrific. And so, I'm, but I just, I was doing it, right? I'm like, I, at this point, I was committed. And I'm with the dollar anyway, and I'm just like, okay, yo, I'm, I'm fine with this. And so I, I shake, like, 300 kids' hands. But basically ends up feeling at the end that I'm like above myself looking down, which is just the strangest thing in many respects. And then come back down, and then there's like three kids left. They walk us out. Everyone was really happy about us being there. And then we come out of this, and then my hosts are kind of like, okay, let's go get some wraps. And it was, I was not able to move. I like basically went back into the van and effectively just like wept because I was like, I'd never seen that type of poverty at that magnitude and yet, at the same time, met these fabulous youth, which I just thought was um, incredibly fascinating for me. Um, preference? Animal. And just as you think there might be a pattern to it, there are no more stories. Spend much time in India, and you will begin to perceive the presence of untouchability in the strangest of places. For example, daily one sees dogs freely walking around the place, running, running, begging, biting oneself for cleaning or others for protection. Generally, though, during the day, you see them, you see them sleeping, trying to make it through the heat. At night, they appear to come alive. Through the door, one hears howls, squeals, barking in the threes, fours, and fives. It is a veritable lord of the flea-bitten, but with dogs. Here, life seems nasty, brutish, and short-ish, where one finds a nice shopkeeper, kind-hearted activist, or the rare butcher in a veg-dominated city. Of course, most of the time when dogs are moving, they are being shooed away, honked, or debased. They are deemed foul, unclean, and a reminder of poverty. This is no Disney-esque flick. These dogs are dog. One sees the cow differently. As a god, these beings walk around as they wish, where they wish, literally stopping traffic when they pass, they seemingly own India. Indeed, if their freedom of movement were not enough to distinguish them from dogs, wherever they go, people give them offerings of food to bring them good luck. Even their feces is a positive omen. Here, life is wonderful, cushy and long-ish. In fact, given the belief in reincarnation, reincarnation is even longer than that. Other animals seem to fall in between these two. Camels move like the Star Wars snow creatures, slow, awkward, but somehow graceful. This makes sense because Spielberg modeled his creatures on them. Strange that something so futuristic could be easily converted to something moving down the road as a snow's pace, dropping huge loads along the way with a bale of hay in tow, as well as tattoos adorning its side like a child's face painting. Life for these beings is work, work, more work, eating, some sleep, and then defecation. In contrast to the camels, one finds the lambs, like some dope-seeking Californian slacker. All they seem to be interested in is getting some grass and hanging with their buds. <laughs> Occasionally, they are moved around by someone, but this is generally only to find some more hay, which is, of course, with them. Here, life is tasty, mellow, and who cares how long it lasts. Donkeys are yet a different type of animal. These look exactly like the ones in the U.S., but they are shrunk approximately 35%. They compensate for their small size with a huge attitude, bucking and honking for even the slightest of infractions. The result, in between their carrying items, they are either completely left alone or rather well beaten. Peacocks roam like cows, but they do not have the same degree of freedom or power. They are usually penned up, offering their services to the highest bidder. They make a tremendous and horrific amount of noise when they are approached. Monkeys are well monkeys. While strange to see them out and about, especially in the numbers, they are too frequent. They are the most like what I was used to, and thus completely disinterested from the side of storytelling. Clearly, of all the creatures, dogs have the most to gain from changing the system, but they lack the unity. 
dog eat dog is just not a metaphor here. Camels work the hardest, but they are the slowest. Revolution is a fast-paced biz that they are not built for. The donkeys are just asses, no brains, all brawn. The monkeys seem to have all they want, but they are largely limited to the forest. Actually, this is a pretty good deal for them because of urban pollution. Lambs are meek and peacocks are all slow, but no substance. In this context, it seems like the farmer is never going to get their comeuppance. If you remember the story, it's all about getting up. The animals, too, unable to see the farm, focused on the stable, the field, and the barn door. So while we were there, Nav Sarjan finished a film, which obviously is not embedded, so we'll move on with that. <laughs> um, the film was called India Untouched, and India Untouched is um, it's actually free off the internet. India Untouched is an amazing film where they basically went about and confronted political authorities with untouchability and different practices. Most everybody denies it until you show them part of the footage where people are actually carrying um, shit on their heads or they are engaged in some other practice of untouchability, moving dead bodies, moving carcasses, um, shaving uh, the skin off of dead bodies and so forth, butchering and a bunch of different things that involve kind of dead animals and so forth. Everyone's kind of like, no, it doesn't exist any longer until you start showing them their practices, and then they're just like, oh, you mean that? Um, and then it's kind of backing their way into, well, that, those are backward people. And you'd be like, yo, that's the next village. And thus, the film is kind of revealing the sequence, which is um, fascinating. The part I was showing you was uh, concerning a, um, a particular youth um, or group of youth that were kind of interacting with the filmmaker, openly talking about not wanting to be polluted by this woman that was standing right there. Um, so there's simultaneously this, this openness and willing to, willingness to kind of talk about the discrimination of what's taking place and this other issue of kind of being somewhat ashamed of it when kind of contextualized into kind of human rights or, or some other kind of legal issue. Um, so after several years worth of um, kind of focus groups and discussions and uh, pilots and so forth, we, we moved to conclude that in order to answer the initial question of what is working, we needed to actually have some baseline understanding of what untouchability was and how it um, varied, and that also collect information about um, what was done. The census itself is um, about 36 um, single space pages, which includes a variety of information. Um, so essentially what we do, um, we went into a village, or sorry, Essentially what we do is we started from the fact that there's about 14,000 villages in Gujarat. Of course we realize we can't do all of them, nor, nor would we ever be able to pull that off. Um, Navsajan is in about 4,000 villages, and so the idea initially was to do a census of all untouchability practices in each village by speaking to all Dalits in all 4,000 4, 4, villages. Um, a village could range from... Um, about 150 people to maybe 15 or 16, 17,000. So, okay, this, this, this clearly wasn't going to happen. Um, so we started to kind of work with all of Nasser John's workers. We convened several large meetings to bring them all together to talk about it, and that just like was working horribly. And thus we decided to kind of select 100 people, 50 men, 50 women that would go around in teams that would then conduct the census for us. Um, so what we did was we took the 100 and then we took the 4,000 and then we randomly selected um, 1,000 a a thousand for um, community-based surveys and 1,000 for household-based surveys. Um, so literally we like, just pick a village and we're just like, okay, so okay, you, go to, you go do the community, okay, you do the households. Now from that, we'd randomly select whether or not there'd be no stratification, in which case you do the whole community or all the households um, as a whole, or there would be stratification um, in the sense that you would go to a community and you break them down by like gender. So you, you, you break off the Dalit women to one side, the Dalit men to another side, or you break them up by age groups, or you break them up by caste. And we did this to try to ascertain what would be the most comfortable situation you could have to kind of openly talk about something that you think to be problematic. So, Clearly, gender might play a role, so we broke up the men and the women, and we were asking questions. Um, it turns out that this, um, 
only mattered for certain types of, or certain aspects of untouchability, certain things people talked about openly. Um, and then in households, we do the same thing. Um, so caste was held um, constant across the household, but we break people up by gender, or we break them up by, um, by age. And so this allowed us to basically kind of explore all these things about whether or not people are more or less honest um, across different audiences. Um, what we do find out, and this is kind of an aside, what we do find out is that uh, community meetings were very helpful in the sense that someone would be like, because um, basically we went down each practice. So we, we'd ask whether or not um, the Dalit are restricted from going to village wells, yes or no. Then we'd ask, um, okay, this is most practiced by whom? And it's most directed against whom? So in the community meetings, so this could be a community meeting, like literally someone would be like, no, that doesn't happen here. And then someone would be like, you know, Hindu, what the hell are you talking about? You remember that time? And so the community meetings became this kind of collective for calling people out in different things. Um, what became intriguing for me was um, the upper class, the, the perpetrators would occasionally show up to meetings. And then people felt uncomfortable about asking them to leave. Which, from my perspective, is just like, this is like the Panthers meeting with a Klan's member in the audience. <laughs> Where I'm just like, I'm like, um, they're part of the reason why you're in the trouble that you're in. What do you mean you're not going to ask them to leave? And they're just like, well, you know, they're, they're part of the community. I'm like, there's so much about this. You didn't ask me about the story passing time, but we had a whole, like, several weeks worth of conversation about passing. Because it turns out that if you are a Dalit in one part of India, you might not be a Dalit in another part. And I'm like, well, why wouldn't everybody figure out where the best place is and move? Um, evidently, they're not doing that in part because they don't think they should. So literally every time in this country um, when I feel I've got a handle on something, something else is done, and that shifts. So we then ask everybody. So if it's a community meeting, um, while the community is the unit, we actually handed the forms out to each individual, and then we walk through everything. So we actually end up with 98,000 individuals. Um, so we go through that list that I showed you in the beginning. Um, what's interesting is most people, when they talk about untouchability, they talk about um, the so-called upper caste and their persecution of the Dalit. What they miss is that um, the Dalit also persecute one another. And that form of discrimination is a separate entity. Um, the correlation between these two is like uh, 0.18. There's really no relationship between them. And so now we're trying to figure out exactly why the Dalit persecute one another in a different way than they are being persecuted. Um, and then we also ask questions about um, um, atrocities, because there's certain types of incidents that take place, incidents of overt like group violence. Um, so for example, there, there used to be a practice um, I forgot what the name of it is now. Um, there used to be a practice when um, you as an upper caste would go to somebody's uh, hut, you go to somebody's um, house, you take off your shoes, leave them at the front door, and you can go in and do whatever you wanted to with the contents of the house. So, rape, whatever. If other people came to the house and they saw the shoes, they're not supposed to go in. Um, so Martin Maquan gets into being an activist because one of his friends did go in the house and threw the person out. That person left. They came back with a large number of individuals who then beat senseless that individual and somebody else that was there. Um, so that would be an incident. So we're asking about that, when it occurs, and then um, move from that database to try to figure out exactly how that relates to other types of abuses. Um, and we also ask people um, um, what they've done to try to eliminate untouchability. Um, do they have a conversation, a boycott, petition, sit-in, protest, march? Uh, remember, this gets at the, this helps us get at the question that the, um, that the initial um, interview or meeting I had with Martin was trying to get at, trying to get some sense of efficacy. Um, so what we end up doing, what we end up doing is um, we had a whole bunch of um, uh, different types of discriminatory practices. So this one concerned, uh, I think, touch. So we have all the different components of touch. Um, so the touch element of discrimination as in touchability is like it's 
we acknowledge that we can never actually know what that is. So that's a, that we view that as a latent variable. So then we take the components of these measures that we have, and we're saying, okay, we have these 10 aspects of this particular phenomena, and we know that we can never actually get at what this real phenomena is, but can we use these 10 things to kind of approximate it? And so what we do is basically, um, if something is loading strongly on that latent variable, then it's very high. If it's not loading at all, then it's very low, but it might then kick in towards one point. And so we use the subcomponents to create like a touch component of untouchability. And then we put the different subcomponents together. We put the different subcomponents together to, to then develop one untouchability score. And so this shows us how strong the different subcomponents help us predict the major component. So religion really doesn't do anything for us. It's essentially flat, and that's because religious discriminatory behavior in almost every village existed. There was no variation whatsoever, so it was, it was constant. Um, social sanctions, sanctions of public services load very highly. This gives us the measure itself. So you could actually go to like, okay, I'm just interested in whether or not people had access to wells which is one of the hundred things that we paid attention to. You could just study that, or you could say that there's this thing out there that's in touchability, and try to figure out exactly how to study it, and we offer one approach for doing that. Um, what's it look like? Um, so this is for one of the um, districts called Anon. Um, the yellow represents the, um, the highest point of our measure and the kind of dark purple represents the lowest. Um, all that this is meant to show you is that there is variation across these locations with regards to how much untouchability that people report. So with the, um, with the results, uh, we, then wrote a, we then wrote a report. This is, uh, this is the report where we discussed how we went about the business of trying to compile this information. Um, we discussed our conception of untouchability, where specifically it came, comes from in terms of the ethnographic work that helped reveal things and also the religious texts. We provide all that argument. We then discussed the particularities of how we go about measuring untouchability, um, something that had been done in a couple of villages, but not um, 1,500, nor that addressed 98,000 people. So it's the, it's the largest study um, thus far. Um, one, one thing, and this came from, this came from Martin, um, effectively, much of social science research, um, I get chased out of Rwanda after I do my Rwanda stuff, truth be told. Um, the Rwandan government did not like what I said, and um, despite the fact that I, I to, be, to be clear, I, I said there was a genocide and there was something else that happened. And that that's something else that happened, um, civil war and random targeting and um, Hutus killing Hutus, that thing might have killed more people than the Hutu anti-Tutsi violence. So there's a genocide, there's some random killing, and then there is some Hutu on Hutu violence. That got spun to, I denied the genocide. So, which is a smart move for them, because then I'm not talking about Rwanda, which they don't want me to do, but now I'm doing it again. But part of the whole do your research and then you kind of go and write your books and articles bit, um, this got altered by, by being in India. And so from the beginning of when we said we were going to do this, we said we were going to go back to the communities and talk to them about what it is that we found. Just looking, I found, uh, I brought two of these, actually. So what became, what became useful is um, we went back, we went back into, I'll admit, I didn't do all 1589. I, I just did like 400. We went back to go to the villages 
where we had conducted the studies, and we talked about the results. But what was interestingly um, done was we compared them to their neighbors and to others that were in Gujarat. This became fascinating as many people had come to kind of experience um, their discrimination and their violence themselves, not necessarily acknowledging that others were experiencing something that was comparable. And that realization became extremely important. Now, Nasajan does this all the time, but this communicated something in a very different, in a very different way. Um, and this kind of reemergence or reinsertion back into the community of the research, because normally, normally we take, right? Normally we do not go back. Normally we are not viewed as a partnership, but this was very much viewed as a partnership, acknowledging that we could not do this without them. This is another from Patar, where basically um, these, these, these little cups and dishes are, are all distributed all over the place, which becomes um, something to see. Um, Inevitably, we, we get to the, the more kind of um, standard scholarship. Uh, we just recently wrote a piece in the, the Journal of Peace Research, which is really about, um, while initially the first thing I thought I was going to write would be about writing about the variation and touchability practices, like which places are worse. Um, what I became aware of while I was there, though, um, it's one of those embarrassing stories, right? It's kind of like one of those ugly American stories that you'd rather not think about, but whatever. Um, so we go to some village, we're talking about some problem, and the, pro the predominant problem in this particular village was access to water. And then so we started talking about, like, well, you know, what, what needs to get done? And it turned out that there was a pipe right below where we were standing, and all the pipe needed to do was be turned on. So I was like, get the shovels, let's go. And I thought my position was relatively reasonable. Mukesh was with me, he didn't say anything initially. But I was like, yo, get them right now. And so then people went off to go get um, some shovels. And then they come back. And like, you know, I roll up the sleeves. I'm ready to go do my good social justice thing. And then I'm like, I think I just kind of put the shovel in the ground. And like, and Mukesh, very subtle, was just like, we're leaving in a week. And I was like, so we should move quick. But his point was, we leave in a week, these people are here. And those people who are now looking at you are going to come down after we leave and beat the hell out of these people. Just as we saw, we saw some bloated body like three weeks before that, where someone was beaten up for, for taking a similar type of activity. And thus, that became useful. But as it related to the article, what became important for me was that the people that, sh the people that were there, the people that we were talking to about this particular issue, um, they then started to think about other forms of discrimination. Um, and it became this, this catalog of, you had to basically come up with a list of activities that they engage in, and then acknowledge that those activities fit with these other activities to give you what untouchability was. Because people had compartmentalized the different activities and ways that they were living with this um, discriminatory and violent activity. Um, at the same time that we were doing this, um, Martin has this kind of creative explosion while we're doing all the census taking and the writing and analysis of the other stuff. Martin starts to realize that um, many of the children have no sense of what they could be living like. And thus it becomes a broader conversation of, okay, what would life be like if these untouchability practices did not exist? And thus he starts spinning off um, a bunch of books um, that choke Chotabim, um, we're having some conversation, and um, I re and Bekdar was fascinating because he basically made the argument that that untouchability would always exist as long as Hinduism was around, and that what needed to happen was you needed to get rid of Hinduism, or you needed to convert to Buddhism, which he, he viewed to be a, a much more peaceful and equitable kind of practice. And so, effectively, and Bekdar kind of pushed this, got a bunch of people to convert. It does not, and Bekdar's story is a, is a very, a very, very sad one in many respects. Um, but needless to say, it does not work out well for, for him or the particular movement. Um, Gandhi and the Pune Pact does a whole bunch of things to kind of undermine him, but separate point. Um, but effectively, um, we were kind of talking one time when Martin was kind of giving a lecture to some kids. I'm just like, yo, man, you just have a bunch of little Ambectars running around. And that's what Chote de Bim means, actually, um, which became interesting. Um, how effectively... Um, different parts of the project began to spin off in different ways that we started thinking about different things. 
um, the idea of acknowledging that your hands are capable of doing different things, You're, you as a human being are capable of doing different things, what is proper to have happen to you as a Dalit, what is proper to have done to you if you're viewed as an untouchable, all of these juxtapositions then start to get um, brought forward. Um, so we finish all this research, and then I noticed that in the reviews of the article that I received, but also when I'm talking to individuals, it's just like, you know, like, so what is untouchability like? And I'm just like, I'm like, okay, so it's like, um, it's like Jim Crow and slavery, and I mean, it's just like the concatenations keep coming, and it's just like on crack. And just like, that, that always ended whatever I said. I'd have a long list, and it'd be like, on crack. Because I just became the way to kind of like communicate it. But that's really not that helpful, especially for people who are not from New York in the 80s. They don't quite get how crack is bad. So, so then you start to realize what's going on. But then it occurred to me, uh, one of the books that Martin wrote, Martin took our census, and he created a book called um, Me and My Village. So essentially, he took the census, and he turned the census into a children's book. So the first page in the children's book opened to show this. And, and then what happened was um, there, were, there were spaces that were placed at each location because they all represent things that exist in the village, right? This is where the, this is where the water is. This is the, this is the barber shop. This is where kids play. This is school. This is a, a funeral. And, and essentially, um, we'd have a box, and then you checked it if the thing that was described in the book actually existed there. So he, um, we, were not, we were not, for the census, we were not tapping people below a certain age, right? So we weren't, we weren't tapping the kids. But Martin, especially thinking of the school, he was acknowledging that kids are experiencing these things and seeing them, and that the sooner we get them to acknowledge what they saw and that this was improper, then we can get little chota bims. And I'm just like, so part of me is like, yo, my RB has nothing to do with kids. So I'm, I'm like, I'm out. I'm just watching. Um, and yeah, so IRB, so if, if you're a university professor and you wish to engage in research that has human subjects, there's a whole bunch of things that you need to be concerned with. This is one of the reasons why you're not legally able to do research on youth in certain contexts because this is bad for them. So my university have facilitated my doing research um, and then restricted me from doing certain things. So certain these things I was out, but the group was doing this anyway. But I just happened to be associated with the census and thus I knew it was coming. So the children's book for me I thought was just brilliant because then you had people that were just ripping out the first part of the book and then submitting these pieces of paper to an officer, John, and then we had another source of information about what was going on. And the comparison of what the children reported versus what the adults were reporting became also something that was interesting. So um, my, my interest in gaming came from um, uh, when I was in Houston. I worked in this uh, Shape Cultural Center, and I wanted to do a class on political education um, with uh, Deloitte Parker, fascinating guy. Um, but part of the thing was just like, uh, how do you communicate to a bunch of kids who don't really want to pay attention to anything you're saying? How do you communicate to them how politics influences their life? So I was just kind of like, all right, well, actually Monopoly and a bunch of other board games we play deal with a very bunch of complex issues. And so I, I just thought there had to be some way of trying to create a board game of discrimination and untouchability. And everyone was just like, come on, give me a break. I'm just like, yo, Monopoly is actually very complex. I'm like, yo, the game of life is very complex. But none of us ever read the book, right? Someone always knows what the rules are, and they tell everybody else. So I'm just like, you just need to get the buy-in from the first person. And so I created this other board game called um, Power to the People, which was about repression dissent dynamics. I use it in a class on social movements and state repression. And so basically, I would force one person to read the book, and then they basically would then communicate to everybody else what the rules were. And so the idea was to create this for untouchability. So you have the random lot with regards to kind of what caste you're born into. Um, we, we, okay, yes. My, my, my father was a graphic designer. My mom was a painter. We argued about what the symbols would be like for weeks. But it was a good conversation because you're trying to kind of, um, kind of concretize an idea very clearly. And then we have a bunch of different things that you're trying to kind of engage in. And what happens to you is in part a function of who you are, right? Um, and also, you're trying to kind of worry about enhancing various things as you're going along playing this particular game. Um, the play, spin, get your identity, get your subcast, pick your character across a bunch of different dimensions, then the whole move around the board. Very, very straightforward dynamic, except your life hangs in the balance, right? Not just this life, but all of them. 
you come back repeatedly to play the same character. Of course, the repeated play bit, get, get, we, we had a bunch of arguments about that. You can't play forever unless um, we had reincarnation discussions, which became also fascinating. Um, and so this is kind of where we went with that. And so now we're in the final process of like, uh, completing, completing the game. Um, after years of my talking about um, India and uh, traveling there, um, my mom basically gets to the point of, all right, I need to go. Um, but it also came that uh, I think Martin was in town um, in D.C. at the time, and um, my mom was in town, and then I was like, oh, I'm going to meet my, my Indian colleague, and then she went, and then Martin was just like, wow. And so mom is humble. I don't know what, I don't know what was up with the 50s, right? But, but she, she's like, she did a whole bunch of stuff in her life and never really talks about it. She's now writing about her memoirs, so now I'm finding out stuff. But Martin got somehow got more of the story out of her than I did, which was very frustrating. But at the same time, nonetheless, she talked about all these different things that she was doing. And then Martin was just like, we've always wanted to have a museum of Dalit history and, and the, um, a sense of our lives. And so he brought my mom out for a couple of months to basically be on the school, teach painting, um, teach some dance, and then start painting. And so... Um, it, the process became interesting for me because it revealed that um, I'm more like my mother than I anticipated. The amount of research she put into reading about untouchability and pointing out stuff to me was extremely useful, in part because of the way she went about it was very different. And so she spent this time working on these paintings and then um, kind of discussing with them exactly what is and is not um, taking place. Um, then they collaborated on um, a couple of uh, children's books, uh, this being one of them. Um, and perhaps, perhaps the most intriguing use of completed census forms, they created paper mache art that we then distributed to everybody that participated in the census effort. And so literally all the time and effort that people have put into this piece, and this was the other element of giving back that they had embodied within the research, which I thought was also fascinating, um, became quite something. Um, so where do we stand now? Um, we're working on a book, um, which is basically kind of working out what the concept of untouchability is, laying out the measurement that we developed, we are then actually having a, a data release conference where basically we're inviting scholars to one location to analyze the data as they see fit. Part of the difficulty with studying India is that many people are not releasing their data. The, the element of kind of openness and uh, the not being proprietary with your data is, it, just being a democracy is also kind of fascinating, but they're not releasing enough, so we're trying to make these things um, as available as possible. With regards to the project, we are debating about a second census. It took three years to do the first time and cost several hundred thousand dollars, so that is like moving very slowly. We only did Gujarat, so we're trying to actually move the project to every other state of India. Similarly ambitious, but um, we're, we're kind of crazy. So um, we did never, we, we basically, we, uh, we interviewed and interacted with the Dalit community. We did not interact with the upper caste. This became interesting because then the question is if getting rid of untouchability is changing these people this is analogous to going back to going back to the clan going back to the, the white southerners that were engaging in kind of racist activity it's like going back to them and asking them under what circumstances could you imagine not engaging in these practices obviously we can't ask them that straightforward right so so the field experiments were going to allow us to kind of explore a bunch of different rights issues and what would be necessary to transform someone's opinion or behavior um, and step away from that particular position. Um, some short stories on Gandhi versus Mbekdar. That is a separate point, and that normally gets me in trouble, so I think that's kind of where I... Uh, fascinating study. You picked uh, Gujarat, which is the place where you know the riots and the killings occurred in the... Hindu-Muslim conflict years ago. So you can assume as a social scientist that 
you have picked the worst state in the nation, presumably, let's say that. So why do you need to do any more states? You have some idea, so now the next thing is to what are you as an outsider working with the insiders going to do about it more than just doing, you know, a hundred more surveys or in whatever states? So, so while they had riots, right, so, I mean, Gujarat's huge. You only had riots in certain parts of Gujarat, so we can't really generalize up to Gujarat. But as a state, it's one of the wealthiest states. And so there's this connection that most people have made with that untouchability is simply a practice of um, kind of uh, geographic isolation. It's it's the back. It's the most backward of locations. They engage in uh, they engage in that. And then once economic development comes to an area, then those practices will no longer exist. Um, and so it's it's good in testing it in that manner. We need to go to other states to get some places that are a little bit less developed. Um, I, I'm clearly not of the um, and it's weird, right? Because much of how the social sciences are, st are structured is just like we're not supposed to speak until. The, the study is extremely solid and we're as comprehensive as possible. But I started to realize that that's not stopping a whole bunch of other people from speaking. So what I'm trying to do is get enough of the study done that I feel comfortable speaking, acknowledging that, and um, doing this project, I started to realize that there were some distinct differences in the research team, right? So I'm interested in kind of being comprehensive and getting some reasonable conclusions. Um, part of what Nafsa John's agenda was to get people talking about this topic. So they want to go from state to state to move this awareness of social justice and social activism. My interest was, okay, we, we might need to have some greater variation on some of these characteristics to speak about those issues. But what we move to now is, um, now we have the information, it was kind of like, okay, what's, what is most effective? Getting back to the, so now we're, now we're able to kind of answer their question about what's most effective. And like other things that happen, um, um, there's not tensions, um, differences. So they wanted to run immediately to what worked and the, their opinion about what we generated. And thus, they started kind of writing this, they started writing a book basically about the psychology and the history. And I'm like, yo, we didn't do any psychological evaluations, so I'm not quite ready to go there. So, so they kind of ran with that pro part of the project. And then what I wanted to kind of do or where I wanted to kind of guide the group in terms of this impact assessment, we needed to acknowledge that we have a cross-section of activism. So our stuff goes from like 2000, 2005 to 2008. I think that's those three years. And we asked about the previous five years of activism. But clearly the activism and the untouchability, untouchability is changing much slower than the activism, so we might get some sense of impact. But we really needed... We actually needed more data points to get some leverage on the fact that we were just looking at a particular time period and there might be something distinct about that time period. And so it's, it's odd in the sense that activists are active, right? And, and part of the difficulty with the, the social scientists is they're slow as hell. And so there's that tension. But my interest is more in trying to give them information about what the next program should be. And so um, we're working through those tensions. But I think it was useful to kind of acknowledge that I felt comfortable, the group felt comfortable about saying certain things and not feeling comfortable about others. And, and then we were shifted in a sense of the minute someone's killed for some kind of um, untouchability practice, that's the group. The group's going there. They're focused on that. And, and, then, and then they left us. And so effectively, we, we need to acknowledge that you can't tell a human rights advocate to not engage in human rights activism. And so our scholarship has been somewhat slowed down by the complexity of the problem, right? And so uh, while we're trying to move in this direction, I think we've also acknowledged that we have to move at the pace that they're most comfortable with. And so we've tried to compartmentalize things so we can continue going about parts, and then the parts come back together. But the interdisciplinarity part becomes um, in part connected with the fact that different disciplines and different people and different networks are on different time scales, and they have different priorities, and we need to, we've been trying to adjust with that. Part of, for me, the, the interesting part about working on this talk, but also thinking about how we communicate this, I, I find, part of what I find, sorry, part of what I find interesting is um, how we all got together. I mean, like, um, I don't really like lawyers, basically, because um, I think human rights law is, like, is really kind of gutted in many respects from its ability to actually do some things. So I've always been kind of like, oh, I don't really need that. Um, and then I, was, I always viewed myself as more of an activist, and so I was kind of drawn to that particular part of it, but then I realized that 
a lot of their just being active was not that reflective. And so we've been working out a bunch of tensions. But what I really wanted to create was some matrix, right? So like, if you are an activist and you're interacting with an academic, okay, these are the five things you need to look out for. This is, this is what they mean by inference. This is what they mean by evidence. This is what I mean, like, and literally, but also, you need know, if you're a sociologist talking to an anthropologist, these are the five things you need to look out for. I just want that matrix. I'm just like, someone has to have done it someplace because because each project I have that's interdisciplinary, we have to go through this whole, we, we lose so much time by trying to go, what do you mean by that? Oh, you meant by, you know, or like weeks later, just like, oh, you didn't really piss me off. Actually, that's what you meant by evidence. Okay, now I get it. So it's just like, um, we need to kind of work through those things, and I think that's why we're going slow. In this country, there, there's anecdotal evidence that some of the uh, changes that, of the attitude between blacks and whites came from uh, popular television where you see uh, blacks as, as um, supreme uh, lawyers or, or judges or, or police commissioners. And uh, can the same thing happen somewhere and in, in India where you have used the popular television shows and, thing, and it changed the attitudes of people by looking at uh, 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 just um, drama and, and plays and, and television, just to, uh, as part of the one of the tools for changing attitudes. I wish it was that easy. Actually, um, what what I find intriguing, um, I, like if you allow me to personalize it for a second, what I find interesting is, in all likelihood and probabilistically speaking, I am the first black professor that many people see in class. So that's like. You know, black, black, black professors on TV. What kind of TV show would that be, right? I, mean, it's like, I, don't, I don't merit a TV show. <laughs> not many people do. But then there's just so many aspects of society where you're not like you're more likely to see the the, the black bus driver or train operator than you are, or or black cop than you are instructor or lawyer, right? So it's just like the inequities even there would be unfair. But the life that you're in, the, the life that you're kind of embedded within, which I think has a the far more kind of powerful impact on our attitudes and so forth, that discrepancy is still so great that you could have the black lawyer on television and it's still not going to offset the general life that these people lead. And it's this weird thing where like um, I started noticing like when I, was, when, I, when I look at student evaluations, I'm just like, damn, I'm not that bad. And it was bad in the sense that I was viewed as being extremely aggressive and hostile. And I'm just like, damn. I'm like, oh, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of bad. I don't mind kicking people out, but I'm just going, I'm like, uh, it's not that hostile. And then someone was just like, they, they hit me to this fact. They were just like, He's like, how many black professors do you think they have? And I'm just like, well, you know, I was naive in the beginning. But I'm just like, well, why, why should that matter? They were just like, it's like, why would you listen to you? And I'm just going, I'm like, damn. OK, so then I started contextualizing like this whole regular life thing. And TV, right, you know, it's not supposed to be regular life. So, you know, why would we have that kind of influence? But I wish it was like that, because then we could just design some TV shows, right? But um, like uh, Jennifer Eberhardt's got this um, great work. She's, a, she's a, um, a psychologist from Stanford. She's got this stuff. That basically, um, so like, you know, people serve on juries and effectively she shows that people evaluate the guilt of somebody by how stereotypically they look black. So the darker skin you are, the guilty you are. The broader the nose, the guilty you are. And I'm just like, this is before anything ever happens. But then this controls for content. It controls for type of arrest and so forth. But I'm just like, we've had a bunch of TV shows now where like, you know, the black person isn't always guilty. Although probabilistically they probably are. So... So I'm just like, so there's something in the culture that's diffusing this information that, that partly is coming from popular culture, and the rest of it's coming from like daily existence, and that is not matching up. We clearly need to switch that up a bit more. Um, I'm presuming, of course, that the, the ultimate aim in all of this is, is the empowerment of, of, of the group of people that you are talking to and dealing with, and not the shock value of the things that you might see, which are, of course, inevitable. There are going to be things that uh, are shocking to you, to anybody else that you talk about, but that doesn't lead anywhere because there's shock value in a lot of places. So I think that the comparison, given that, the comparison between the kind of discrimination that happens in India and the kind of discrimination that happens in America is a little problematic to me because I think that there, there are discriminations that happen at two very different levels. If one was to look at the, the, the reason why the discrimination happens in untouchability, it is mainly 
based not so much on race, but professionalism. It is what it is that you do that is the, that is the discriminating element. You are the one that cleans, you pick up the feces, you do the leather work, you do the meat cutting. Those are the elements of discrimination in India and not so much what you look like, where you come from, what, or, or, or a variety of other things that happen in America. I say this because I think that is where the key to many of these issues they, that if one understands that rather than thinking, oh look, here is just another upper class oppressing uh, a lower class. It's not as simple as that. It's that you do this and therefore I will not touch you because you are dirtier than I am. And so the, the elements of purity, cleanliness are highly, highly interwoven in this whole thing. I will not drink from your cup because I don't know, you might have touched meat and I do not eat meat, so I'm not going to drink from your cup, right? I, you might have touched the feces of a cow, and then you come and touch my vegetables. So I'm not going to have you in my kitchen. The basis of discrimination are these. It is what you do that discriminates you from one to the other. So I think that needs to be made very clear that it's not what you look like and where you come from, or, uh, but, but what you do as in, in terms of your professional class. I would agree with you completely. I think um, part of the part of the difficulty in in people actually getting an understanding of some of the differences between caste and race um, would be that we've forgotten like the historical time periods under which these things were developed. I mean, I'm a big fan of Oliver Cox. If people are aware of his discussion, I think this is very useful. I mean, the context within which untouchability and, and caste discrimination was created several thousand years ago. The type of society that they were trying to create was eff effectively static. It was effectively trying to get people to stay in a particular location, but because they were supposed to stay in that position, not because they actually could have potentially rose to other locations. So part of what we see in terms of racism is you're trying to keep individuals from aspiring and moving between different classes and so forth. This is not a possibility within this particular context of untouchability. There's a fundamental kind of shift in terms of how the social, political, and economic structures were, were put together. And I mean, clearly the thing, um, the simplicity in many respects with regards to kind of um, color and so forth is that designation is not playing at all within the Indian context because you can't tell that way. Um, part of how you tell someone's caste is by self-identification. Someone tells you. It's part of the introduction. Well, which it's is, the name. You just give your name out and everyone knows where you belong, right? Yeah. Just, just your name will do it. You know? Which is what for me led to the kind of passing conversation, right? Because the minute I heard that, I'm just like, oh, so it's possible that if you were in Rajasthan that you'd be treated differently than you would Uttar Pradesh and they're just like, yeah, and I'm like, well, damn, that would be the information I would get. But then, but then people don't wish to, this attachment to, the, I think there's a localism that's involved with this as well, which is very powerful, which is also kind of, we tend to view African Americans exist within a market, right? It's a global market, but in many respects, you're, you're black wherever you go. But this variability with regards to kind of your, your identity and how people treat you, this relational dynamic shifting as you move across space, that, that for me I thought was another element of kind of the difference, but I, I agree completely. I, I would add that, you know, I'm sure you've noticed that even in the caste system, and yet there is that sort of variability. You will find new castes being created, you know, over the course of time that you were, you think, oh, there are four, three castes, and then, oh, now there are four, and then there are all these other subcasts. And so castes and things are constantly created, so there is a certain amount of mobility even in that society. I, I just want to end by saying this, that I, I have faith that, you know, systems of um, social systems throughout the course of history usually function to, not to the detriment of humanity, even though there are injustices in them, right? So looking back historically at social systems, we can find fault at them, just as someone looking back at our social system today will find faults with them. But I still feel confident enough that if one is to look at these systems carefully enough, one can see where they worked as well as where they failed. And, and the places where they worked might perhaps prof You're, you're, you're much more helpful than I am. Yes. 
I don't know if this will be a great for final question, but uh, as as a as a layman, my understanding uh, of the current Indian state and its constitution is that uh, untouchability has been outlawed. Um, and clearly your experiences and from what I've read that there's obviously uh, legally there's still a whole host of uh, issues in involved when it comes to any kind of adjudication of, of crimes. But I'm curious as a relation to, to your study, you, you've done so much work cataloging all these various um, uh, areas of discrimination that it sounds like weren't really labeled as such prior to the discussions, prior to your interviews. I wonder if you see a future uh, with uh, how laws might be interpreted, and if you could also perhaps address what is the current state of Indian law when it comes to a number of these discriminatory practices, since there's some sort of blanket understanding, but I don't know about individually. No, I mean, this, this is one of the reasons why um, Napsa John pairs up with this organization, John Vikas, which is a, a series of lawyers. Um, Part of what they're doing, if you actually look at the kind of Supreme Court rulings from the Indian Supreme Court, it's the laws are phenomenal with regards to kind of like what should the society look like. There's just simply no investigation and no enforcement. And this is kind of where Ambedkar and kind of Gandhi split. So Ambedkar was just like, uh, Gandhi was fundamentally like, if we just kind of reveal information to people, then uh, the Hindus will self-correct because they are, they are a just and noble people. And Ambedkar was just like, hell no, that's not going to work. What we need is an organization that will investigate these abuses, find these people, prosecute them, and basically bring people to justice. And that did not necessarily work out in this particular manner. So part of the difficulty is the localism part fits in because essentially these social practices are taking place in rural villages and there is no untouchability investigation board. Every 10 years there's a reevaluation about whether or not certain types of, um, uh, whether or not the practice or whether or not the laws that exist that talk about uh, positive discrimination and other things should persist. And then they conduct another evaluation to determine if untouchability is found. And they've done this for like four, they do it every 10 years and they've done like four or five now. Each time they find that untouchability still exists and they go back to doing it. But this doesn't need to, so I thought, where I thought you were going to go is like, will our study lead to some kind of class action lawsuit? And uh, effectively, we're trying, that's, that's why we had a government counter study. Because effectively, if our study is correct, then there's rampant illegality in, in, in Gujarat, and then the government needs to do something about it. That's why they try to kind of invalidate our work. But effectively, part of what John Vikas does is they find all of these locations. Part of the, one of the discriminations um, is like access to public um, facilities. And so where we've been able to document that, and the people are willing to kind of come forward and place the, um, the kind of case in the docket, then those particular legal proceedings are, are, are pushing forward. And so part of this effort, um, we, we were, this was not my part. My part was making sure that the documentation and the study was done properly. Um, how that data is being used by individuals in the field is now connected with all these kind of um, micro social justice efforts that will hopefully lead up to the broader discussion of this practice still exists. We can't wait every 10 years. We need other types of bodies that are more consistently investigating and more importantly prosecuting individuals for these abuses. And we just haven't gotten to that point yet, and that's part of kind of raising the awareness of these particular abuses because that's the thing that needs to happen. There's this uh, huge kind of difference between the federal government of India acknowledging that there is a problem and then punting. I mean, we thought that kind of decentralization and federalism was a problem for existing in the United States and allowing the South to basically get away with what they were doing in terms of racism for a while. This is even worse. It's even larger and there's even greater punting. So in this respect, you kind of need um, one of the one of the things that I end up kind of suggesting in one of my stories is that there needs to be some kind of investigatory body that would basically exist within every village, document the, the problems. That would be then punted up to some other organization that would figure out exactly who is the correct body to kind of go to. Nafsa John is doing some of this. They, that's why they have the people in the 4,000 villages. They're monitoring human rights violations and then progressively kind of providing that information to other people that needs to get done and then doing the follow-up with making sure the people that come forward aren't abused following things through the court system, following things with people need to be moved because they're now being threatened, all these things simultaneously. And you need to have the kind of comprehensive approach, but simultaneously view all these villages simultaneously, which is just, it's the sheer largesse of the problem is one of the reasons why it exists and has been around for so long. But the other thing is that India is huge. And that as long as you're kind of like, well, we're not gonna address 
we're not going to address these particular villages in this location as long as that part exists. The mobility in between villages becomes extremely important as well as you see people kind of moving through. But part of the thing we think is this whole thing of we need to raise awareness to untouchability and caste discrimination is a persistent problem. But getting back to some of the other points, there is variation. There are places where it is better than others. And the question is to try to figure out how did that particular village evolve to that particular kind of state or situation. So, cool. Thank you.